Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's video. So today we are beginning chapter eight here. Chapter eight is all on chromosomal variations, but to begin understanding the different chromosome variations, we have to understand how to look for them. And a big way to look for them is something known as karyotyping. So the focus of today's video is just going over an introduction uh, to the chapter. So how we do karyotyping, what is karyotyping? We're going to look at the staining of karyotyping, the different bands that show up, and then an introduction to the mutations we're going to talk about in the upcoming videos in chapter eight. Uh, so we did talk about karyotyping and chromosome structure and organization before. So I'll put a link up here. I think it was episode two. So way back in the beginning of the semester, we talked about karyotyping. But as a little reminder here, a karyotype is a complete chromosome set. So right here, you know, example image down here of a complete chromosome set. I believe this is a human chromosome karyotype. So you got all you know chromosomes 1 through 22 and the X or the sex chromosomes. And now you can see on this karyotype, there are different dark bands, light bands, and so forth. And that's what we're going to talk about today is how we can distinguish one chromosome from another. Remember, these are homologs that are all lined up here. So how do we prepare a karyotype? How do we get to this stage? of diagnostics. So karyotypes are a very important diagnostic tool. You can look at someone's complete set of chromosomes from a cell and determine if there are any abnormalities. So something like trisomy 21, there would be three number 21 chromosomes. So right down here, uh, I believe this is chromosome 21 down here. So right there, there would be three of them, which is, you know, diagnostic tool. You would see that in the karyotype. You can also see, you know, translocations, which we haven't talked about those yet, but that's when a piece of one chromosome moves to another. You can see deletions and so forth. So a very, very important diagnostic tool here that's used in, you know, different stages. So now how do we prepare a karyotype? You know, we need this chromosomal arrangement. When do we find chromosomes that are fully condensed into the chromosome structure. So in, in normal, our cells are, you know, just in G0 phase and just doing their job. So we need to find actively dividing cells that are condensed down into chromosomes and going through mitosis. So the first step to preparing a karyotype here is finding these mitotically dividing cells. So these are attained from, you know, individuals, somatic cells, stem cells, uh, you can get them from blood samples and so forth, or that you're checking um, a fetus uh, before they're born to see any karyotyping issues. So previously, uh, in a previous chapter, we talked about amniocentesis, chorionic villus sampling, all those obtain cells from the fetus and do a karyotype on those cells. So first step, obtain the cells. Then you have to culture those cells. So you grow them in a growth media and you culture them in the beginning to divide and replicate. Then you add a really, really neat substance called colchicine. Colchicine actually arrests the cells in metaphase one. Remember, metaphase one is where all the chromosomes line up at the middle. Uh, so it could also be late prophase, but typically we just say metaphase uh, one. So this disrupts mitotic spindles. So remember the spindle fibers. So, you know, when you have your cell here and, you know, all your chromosomes are in the middle, you have your mitotic spindle on each side or the centrosome reaching out and adding attaching the spindles to the central mirrors. So what colchicine does is it disrupts this and prevents the separation then. So it never gets that go-ahead phase into anaphase. So the anaphase is blocked here and it keeps the cells, because as soon as the cell enters anaphase, begins pulling them away and enters uh, telophase, the uh, decondensing of the chromosomes will begin. So you want the chromosomes in the most condensed state, which is late prophase, early metaphase here. So once we have that, once they're all arrested here, now the chromosomes are extracted. So you take the chromosomes out of the cell. So you add something that disrupts the cell membrane here. You take the chromosomes out. Remember the nucleus, nuclear membrane's already gone, and then, or nuclear envelope. And then you take the chromosomes out, you separate them, you smear them onto a slide, and then you stain them. Now there are different stains you can use, and we're gonna talk about those coming up. Uh, so then the stains are used to identify the different homologs. So all these are then identified and placed together via matching the different stains. So, you know, you're looking at this example here, you know, there's a dark region there and a dark region there. That's what's used to match these chromosomes. So then they're photographed and arranged. 
So now we need to talk about the types of staining that are used in this process. So the first one is stains what are called G bands. So this is known as a Giemza stain. This is the stain that you're typically looking at when you see a karyotype image. So I repasted this image here. This is a G band stain. So what G band stain does is it stains AT rich regions. So remember adenine and thymine, they form two hydrogen bonds between each other. GC rich regions are more can condense and hold together stronger because they have more hydrogen bonds. GC is you know, three hydrogen bonds. So the darker bands here are the AT rich bands. So there are certain areas where you know, you're know you undergoing more gene expression and so forth, where you're gonna have these AT rich regions. If you notice at the ends here, the telomeres and also at the centromeres of these, you don't have as many AT rich regions. They're more GC rich. So that's because the area, those areas are more condensed with those guanine and cytosines. So that's why those the ends, the telomeres, are typically lighter on all the caps of these because you're not going through much gene expression there. So that's a G, uh, the G bands, and they're very, very common. This is the typical karyotype that's done. Now, the that wasn't the first one ever invented, though. The first one was actually Q bands, which uses a stain called quinacrine mustard. So this one... Is use, uses UV light and it's determined by the AT to GC ratio. Uh, and this one can be used to look for some translocations as well, you know, but it's not as commonly used now. Uh, so this is just an example of what a UV light uh, Q-band stain would look like. So it just glows different regions as, uh, using the AT to GC ratio under UV light. And again, so here you see you know, brighter sections here at the centromeres where you have a higher GC ratio. So this one can actually specifically label centromeres and so forth. But it's a little bit harder to distinguish some regions. That's why uh, the G band is the, the one that's typically used. It just these, you know, make cool images. And then all these karyotypes can under can be also put in uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization, which we're not going to get into today. It's also known as fish, and that can actually add nice color karyotypes for the different bands and so forth. You might see those places as well. All right, next band, these are called C bands or centromeric heterochromatin. So kind of the opposite of, you know, these ones up here where you're looking at not as condensed regions. This is focused on the highly condensed regions, and there might be times you want to use this and whatnot, but you can usually get this information from the other stains, but this will specifically label where the centromeres are. So it can, uh, if you remember back in episode two, we talked about acrocentric, metacentric, um, and so forth, the different telocentric, where those centromeres are in the chromosomes. So this can specifically label uh, centromeres and telomeres because those are highly condensed regions. So if you look at this, you know, these are all centromeres right here. So you can better match them up. The telomeres are also slightly darker here. And it just helps you locate where the centromeres are on the various chromosomes. So it can help by lining them up here. Now, the last type of band is called R-band stain. So R-bands, this is the complete opposite of G-bands. So this one labels GC rich regions, again, the reverse of the Giemza stain. So this image I found here also shows an uh, interesting part to the staining process. So remember how I said, you know, the cells are arrested and then the chromosomes are extracted and then they look like this from that particular cell. So it's like arts and craft on those. Now there's computer programs that can do this, but all of these, this mess of chromosomes are then lined up like this for a pretty karyotype. But this is just showing an example of R-band staining here where you can see the GC rich regions are slightly darker in these. Again, the opposite of G bands. And typically, like I said, you get the same thing G band sometimes just comes down to what you have in the laboratory. Um, so yeah, uh, this is an example of that. This one here, you can see there are three and some smaller segments here on number six. I didn't actually look into what this figure does. So conventional cytogenics of nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's lymphoma. So I didn't read the specifics of this paper. I was just finding um, an R-band stain example, but it looks like there are three chromosomes right there. So you can look at this and then get an idea of what might be going on there. 
So those are the four different types of stains. Again, the G bands are the most common. And now since this chapter is on chromosomal variations, the purpose of going over these karyotypes right now are to discuss you know, these variations. How do we detect these variations? What could these variations do? What could they cause? Now, you know, like I said, karyotypes are typically used to detect, you know, abnormalities in the chromosome structure. Now you can have finite deletions or insertions in the gene sequence that you can't detect using a karyotype, but karyotypes usually do a great job. So what are the different kinds of chromosomal mutations we're going to talk about in this chapter? The first type are called rearrangements. Exactly what it says, it rearranges everything. So it's a change in structure. So there are four different types of rearrangements that we're going to go over in the next couple of videos. But uh, one thing I forgot to say here for the chromosomal mutations, the, all of these are dealing with altered chromosome number or structure. And the next type of mutation here is called an aneuploidy. An aneuploidy is a change in the number of a particular chromosome. So this is just one chromosome. An example like of this one would be trisomy. So trisomy 21 adds a third number 21 chromosome for Down syndrome. Uh, you can have nullosomies, um, and uh, we'll talk about all the different uh, somies. We'll talk about the autosomal differences that could lead to different diseases, and also the sex-related aneuploidies as well in separate videos. And then last type of chromosome mutation, not as common in humans, but common in plants, is called polyploidy. Polyploidy is a change in the number of sets of chromosomes. So this is when you go from something like 2N to 4N. So, you know, going, going from a diploid to a tetraploid. Not going to work in humans, but plants can tolerate those increased number of chromosome sets. So that will be the last thing we talk about. A lot of videos coming up. Uh, in this section, the first one we're going to be going over, though, are the rearrangements. A couple videos there for going over duplications, deletions, inversions, translocations, and then all the different aneuploidies that exist, and then a quick one at the end going over polyploidies. But it's going to be a fun chapter. Uh, this starts getting us into the molecular biology of things uh, for this. I guess this would be the next unit here. So one of my favorite areas in genetics. So you'll see me having lots of fun with this as well. But that's all I have for today. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments. And I hope you all have a great day. And I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.